So as you said, my name is Craig Lane. I am a, uh, I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission in Norwich, uh, one of the towns that got this group started. And several of our a cluster of towns around us, we all had commissioners who uh, had various experiences that were similar town to town. Uh, we all had questions for each other, how things work best. We had complaints to share with each other, uh, struggles, frustrations, ideas, and where to go next in conservation. So we started this gath impromptu gathering of conservation commissioners from this cluster of towns. Uh, and we soon realized that, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense. Very little in conservation stays within town boundaries. So much of, of uh, conservation and ecology transcends town boundaries. So we started wondering what could we work on uh, that would be a good project, all of us could be involved, uh, that would uh, really reflect how conservation should be approached transcending town boundaries. So we thought several of us have been in keeping track training recently, uh, tracking to keep track of wildlife and what parts of the forest they're using. Uh, and see, well, we should probably do something that might help all these charismatic megafauna, all these wide ranging mammals that we had learned about in keeping track. Uh, we could do some kind of conservation project that would work with them. Um, so we first started to think about and look into the literature and see uh, just how much do the home ranges of those animals uh, transcend town boundaries. And so a few of those species that were pictured over here in the first column, and then the average home range, uh, average across the seasons, average across the sexes for these, for these species to see what size of uh, the landscape they needed. Uh, and the percent of an average town's acreage that one of those individuals is using as a home range. So the moose is using 131% of a town's acreage. And so there we go. They're certainly transcending town boundaries. And even the ones that are a little smaller than a town's acreage, Bobcat and Fisher, that Bobcat's home range would have to be smack dab in the middle of a town for it not to be transcending town boundaries. Um, so yeah, we thought this is, there's some promise here. Let's, let's look into this some more. Um, I was amazed to find out a gray fox's home range is so small. Um, so I, I probably have one on my 10 acres. <laughs> I like to think there's one just within my 10 acres. It's eight is nested perfectly in there. Um, there was a reason I had these there to remind me again. Um, oh yeah. So these are all forest animals as I mentioned, right? So, and we live in a, the Eastern deciduous biome if we don't disturb things, it's gonna go back to forest. So what we're really talking about is forest conservation. So I started to wonder what's the forest like out there on the broader scale for these wide ranging mammals. And so this is where we started work, working with fish and game, uh, fish and wildlife in, in, in Vermont. Um, so I'm gonna show you at the beginning uh, pictures of what we did in this project of mapping uh, and conservation just in our 10 town area, but quickly you'll see how it expanded once people saw what we were doing. And so the, the states had not done any of this kind of mapping yet. So this was someone from, uh, from Natural Resources. They had all the data layers, but nobody had done the, the project. And one of the, the uh, non-game specialists and education specialists, uh, Jens Hjelka, was really interested in working on a project like this. So we worked with him uh, and we figured out for our 10 town area, what are all the, how big are all the blocks of forest? Uh, he got into GIS, uh, started to map them out. We all field verified every boundary of every forest block. Uh, so he buffered them around development, uh, but there's a lot of things to check out because some of the layers are old, things change quickly. Uh, they're not all completely accurate. And so what you're seeing there are the forest blocks in that 10 town area, and the darker it is, the bigger it is. Oh. And not surprisingly, in the valleys where historical uh, settlement happened and developed and generally spreads from, they're much smaller blocks. Um, immediately things jump out, like if you have a town that really jumped in hard to 10 acre zoning, you really see what happened in forest blocks in that town. And if you, if you look in uh, areas that have uh, ridge lines, a lot of steep ridge lines, then you'll see bigger blocks as well. General conservation rule, if you're conserving forest or any kind of habitat block, bigger is better. We'll talk a lot about other features other than just the size of the, uh, the plot, but bigger is generally better. So just thought about it that way. So then we went back to our table for wildlife and said, let's add a column for the percent of forest blocks in our 10 town area that are of sufficient size 
for one of those wildlife species. Not surprisingly, moose didn't have anything because it needed more than a town. Um, bear didn't have anything. Uh, no single block was enough. A very, only 1.1% of them was big enough as a single block of forest for a bobcat. So clearly, you're probably already foreseeing a message, connectivity of these forest blocks is gonna really matter because no single one does the job. Um, and you can think of these forest blocks as an as a assemblage of the habitats that that, that animal needs through the different seasons, uh, through the different stages of its life. It needs a slightly different place for reproduction and, and denning than it does for winter feeding. And so it's gonna to need to get from forest block to forest block. A little sadly, even that little eight acre home range for a gray fox, only 12.9% of the forest blocks were big enough to accommodate that. Uh, another way to think of that, it's expanded out beyond just those charismatic wide ranging mammals. This is a little table we like, and if you look too closely at it and read too much into it, you can start to take issue with where they put certain animals. But as a general trend, drumbill pattern, on the left is undeveloped land and all the species uh, that find everything they need in, in, a, in an area that big. And they're generally doing well. Uh, and you will, you will generally run across them. That's not to say you won't see a fisher trot through your two acre patch behind your house, but it's, it's not making life there. Uh, so as the patches get smaller and smaller, less species, and if you live in, in a village, you know that there are skunks, raccoons, rodents, squirrels, you know the things that wander through generally, and they're the ones that can make use of those uh, smaller blocks once fragmentation has happened. So this is a little bit, getting a little closer to having uh, this kind of conservation work being talked about biodiversity. We've gone from just home ranges of particular animals to some diversity of, of wildlife. And that can be taken further. And I think that'll come up more uh, in later parts of the talks tonight. So I, I've already, I've already uh, done a spoiler. Uh, even though the forest patches mostly aren't huge, we still see these things. So why? And I've already alluded that, that the answer is connectivity. And ideally, and I'm sure John will talk more about this, connectivity is great if it's really contiguous forest along a stream or in some other way, uh, along a ridge line. Um, a lot of these wildlife species have to move through the valleys, so it's nice to have connectivity there, and that's where the really small patches are. Um, but the connectivity can also be, it has to cross something. Obviously, it has to cross roads. Uh, or it can be have to have to cross more open habitats. Um, but there are many different ways to think about making sure that connectivity is useful in those organisms. And it's very important, as I've alluded to, for them to find food seasonally, to find shelter seasonally, to find others in their population uh, to mate, and for dispersal of our offspring. All really important reasons uh, for connectivity amongst these forest blocks. There's more to uh, a forest block than just its size. Uh, its quality also matters. And so at, at about this point, uh, the state of Vermont did the mapping, took this further and did it for the whole state. So they mapped the forest blocks for the whole state. Um, a lot based on what, what Jens Hilke had done for our town area. And they wanted to convene a group of ecologists and talk a lot about the quality of the patches. So they ended up being able to make a map where now the different brown shades of the size of the patch, the size of the forest block, uh, the same, the, you might see some different synonyms for what these blocks of forest are. I, for a long time, I just called them contiguous forest patches, uh, habitat blocks sometimes people use, forest block. Vermont is state starts to start using forest block uh, generally. And re, just last time we did our town plan, every town in the state had to at least talk about forest blocks in their town plan, which was a good step forward for conservation. Um, they didn't specify too much exactly what you had to do about them, <laughs> but at least they're mentioned in there as something important on the landscape. Um, so they, they switched from the shades of brown showing the size uh, to different shades showing what ended up being called ecological importance. Uh, the greener it is, the higher ecological importance. Not surprisingly, one of the variables that in, determines importance is the size. So the bigger ones are generally more green. Uh, but you see some, you see some flip-flop on that. Uh, and the smaller ones are generally more yellow, brown, red. 
Now, this is, we always have to point out when we show these forest maps, this is not to say in any way that this forest block is not important. Not surprisingly, in the valleys is where most of the really big productive wetlands are. And so a lot of the wetlands are in these small forest blocks. Really important for biodiversity, really important for wildlife species roaming around the landscape. Um, so they can be really important, and especially important in the connectivity when you get in an area where there's not much else. Yeah. Um, so just to let you know more about what they put into determining this ecological importance of the blocks, on the left are all the things. Uh, core area is, a, is a, just a reference to um, an area of forest that's far from wall development. And so uh, if a block is really close to a big forest block that has a lot of core area, then it gets a high score in that one. And then the parentheses is how much they weighted each variable in their algorithm to figure out ecological importance. Uh, ecological land units, kind of uh, natural communities, another classification system like natural communities, figure how many different kinds of natural communities are in a forest block. That'll certainly be important for diversity. That will expand at the great rate with, uh, with more and more types of forest, types of wetlands. Uh, element occurrence is uh, rare things, endangered things, particularly unique landforms, uh, and particularly unique, for unique forest types are in that database in the Vermont uh, database anyway. Uh, percent of the block that is core. Again, size is really important, just size of the block. Uh, how many roads? Uh, per square mile. So we bordered uh, up to, in Vermont, we, anything, we include class three roads. So anything that wasn't an unmaintained forest road got a buffer around it. So a lot of times there'd be some pretty uh, remote class three roads that you might think that's really not putting much of an impediment to the forest, but you know, you always have to make these kind of decisions when modeling things. And they made the decision that class three roads would be bordered. Um, so how much roads about border the, the block was important. Ponds, wetlands, other exemplary features, streams. And then uh, the TNC, the Nature Conservancy, has uh, classifications of areas of land. And if there's a lot of what they've deemed important in there, it would get a higher rating. And all the people on the, on the group who did the work are on the right there. Um, also, so that generated... Um, So that's what generated this map for all those 10 towns. Uh, and then with all the mapping of the rest of the state, we were able to expand that in Vermont. And if you zoom into one town and turn off the colors of the blocks, you can get a town map that includes all these landscape features. Uh, wet, red is steep slopes, a lot of the blue is wetlands and streams. Uh, and this is, instead of having the, the colors, here's the map of a part of New Hampshire that I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, and so these big blocks, colors are turned off and they're actually still a green line in there, but they're really hard to work with, finding that little faint green line in there and see a block. Uh, but this was a map that we realized that this was really good stuff to take to the schools for education about wildlife and their land use and, and, it's, and land conservation. And so this was a map that we extracted from that map zoom in on a town, take it to the schools in that town. And now the, instead of the colors of the blocks, the background is uh, color orthophotos. So you can see coniferous forest versus deciduous forest versus early succession. And the kids can look at it and uh, look into the look into books and see what kind of prey of bobcats live in these different forests. And they have all these tokens they put on the map and they map out where they need a denning site, where there are wetlands. And they basically figure out how many bobcats can live in their town based on the resources that are predicted from this map that's drawn from uh, the forest blocks map. Um, so it's, it's a good, and we got really into the education and put together a whole education book for all the grades of different activities that use these maps. I want to point that out because the, the one that's really hard to look at over there on the, on the tripod is the, the Hanover version of it. So right. now that you know what it is, you can get a closer look and it's, it's got 911 addresses in there, a little tiny symbol for every building in town. And the first thing that school groups do is find their house and find their school, <laughs> find their way from home to school, uh, and just a really good sense of place activity. They really get to learn their town. Well, this, when we did this, this became popular with teachers. And so now everyone, all these surrounding towns of Vermont say, can we get involved? Can we get involved? Can we get involved? 
And we slowly let them in, not because we didn't want them in, just because we didn't want that overload of work all at once. Um, so you can see the Vermont towns grew, and then New Hampshire found out about it. And so they wanted in, but these data layers don't exist in their database. It's amazing how poorly data is shared across that <laughs> river. Um, so it had to be all uh, redone, but luckily we had a template because we'd already done it in Vermont. And so worked with the Upper Valley Lake Sunday Regional Commission, uh, and they did the, got into the data layers uh, to make the maps on the New Hampshire side. And uh, I realize this is a horrible map. Who knows what country that is? <laughs> that's the section, that's the towns that got mapped for this in New Hampshire. Uh, and they, they made their first map of the blocks just with little faint yellow lines separating all the blocks. Mm -hmm. So that's a mosaic of blocks of different size. But I, I, I didn't worry that it didn't separate the colors because they wanted to jump right away to getting the ecological importance calculated for those different blocks. Same, same kind of scale. Uh, colors look a little different to Vermont. Um, just as a reference, here's the Dorchester, big Dorchester block up there. Uh, Hanover is down in here. And both, uh, it's, in, it's broken into three regions for New Hampshire. Hanover shows up in the North region and the Central region map, and they're both hanging up uh, here, here and there for you to take a look at uh, after the talks. Tried, uh, she tried to do very similar things to estimate the importance of each forest plan. So uh, New Hampshire has a wildlife action plan that ranks habitats. So they could look at that and see in each forest block how many of those habitats are in there. Uh, the landscape units that were in the Vermont one, element occurrence, a lot of them are the same. Uh, roads, wetlands, that's your streams. Um, so it did, did the same kind of modeling to come up with these maps. And here's a, a large scale version of the one with, uh, with Hanover up here near the top. And so here's the, the AT goes through this big block right here. Uh, that's kind of a, you can't really see much when you display that on the screen, even on the map. It's kind of a little too large a scale. So, but when it's electronic, it's really nice. You can just zoom in uh, and not have to print another map. Um, um, so you can start to look at and think about conservation priorities. Oh, this was to remind me that, especially with the AT, so the both states, uh, Fish and Wildlife Departments and people doing this kind of work, see lots of opportunity for northwest corridors, large corridors of wildlife movement, because so much of the mountain uh, spines go north-south. And so there's lots of conserved land up there, but only at high elevation. Something like below, I forget how many feet, but below 4,000 feet, 80% in Vermont is privately owned and 75% in New Hampshire. It's really high. So the far as public lands with conserved large parcels that provide great opportunity for corridors to move north and south is great. The real challenge is east and west. And so there's lots of, one of the, that ecological group in Vermont, one of their tasks was to uh, try to use the model to predict where the, uh, the big east-west uh, movements would be happening. Uh, and one of them is to show up right here. Because it's such big blocks on each side there. Mm -hmm. That's going to take a lot of field testing to, to uh, back that up. We've done a little bit with camera traps in the smaller areas in Norwich uh, to see if there's a lot of movement where it would be predicted. And, and to a large extent it was. Yeah. And then I'll go to my last map is uh, zooming in you know, a little further. Uh, um, to leave it off for a dare to talk about uh, using some of these mapping tools in conservation priorities and conservation approaches uh, in Hanover. Is it okay if people, yeah, I'm just going to ask that. How much of a barrier is the Connecticut River? Well, uh, the river itself, not to a barrier. I think I've seen all those species swimming across it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then sort of, of course, can walk across it in the winter. Yeah. And so in most, in most places. So uh, the river itself, but the amount of development that's yeah. down in that valley is really the challenge to finding that corridor across there. Yeah. Right. I don't want to answer too many questions ahead of time. I don't want to spoil anything in your talk. <laughs> okay. But we'll be here to answer questions after all three. I came here to listen to these two guys. <laughs> I was canoeing down the Connecticut between uh, the sort of Lyme Hanover area and saw a little something in, in the water. And 
what is that, Bill? It was a red squirrel. Well, I should point out when you look at these maps, this is acreages, the AC is acres. So acreages are the blocks. The red black lines are roads. There are good legends on all the maps. And it's someone was pointing out what a challenge is to find things on these maps. Yeah. They, in a sense, they weren't made for us. They were made for the wildlife that are using these forest blocks and connecting between them. We just have to be able to find it. So you find something you know and follow the roads you know and, uh, and pin it down. It's, it's not as bad as what I like to do to my commissioners in Norwich is show them a map with all the roads turned off. <laughs> I say, you guys should know the streams in town too. We're a conservation commission. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had read, I think, that the Appalachian, uh, the, um, uh, Appalachian Trail, they are trying to get a half a mile on each side of that as undeveloped. I don't know anything about no? that. No? Okay. Uh, we, we can talk about that. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you. So did you stop? I did stop. Okay, well now let's see how clever we get with this. Okay. Otherwise, I'm going to be very ungraceful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I think um, everybody knows the Hanover Conservancy uh, here with New Hampshire's oldest local land trust. Love what we do, and especially love being able to be part of, uh, of something like this. And this is not my forward, it's not working. Okay, well, then we're going to do that. I had to use the arrow on my keypad. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm using it online, and it usually works fine for me, but... Jared? No. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is... Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Sure. Okay. I'm done in two weeks. Thank you very much. I, I just did that. Yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sometimes it works, sometimes they don't. Um, we've been protecting land and water in our community for 62 years and um, are kind of getting the hang of it now. Um, we, we work hard on uh, based on a strategic plan that we have that we um, will go into a little bit more detail here. And the goal of one of the main goals in that is protecting land for climate change mitigation, ecosystem resilience, water quality, recreation being a part of it because we realize we got a we got people here who care a lot about this kind of thing. Our conservation impact over those years, um, lands we own, lands that we have easements on, and lands that we helped the town or other organizations protect. Um, Almost 3,000 acres now, we're closing in on that. It's equivalent to taking 1,500 cars off the road every year, if you think about the carbon sequestration. Here's the impact. Um, some things aren't up there uh, quite yet, but you'll see a lot of these uh, crosshatch ones are places where we've been able to help, which we're kind of proud of. So our question here is in Hanover, uh, because we work only, our service area is in the town of Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, where are we gonna conserve and why? Um, and as Craig alluded to, building on the Appalachian Trail, what a great start. The thing runs conveniently from the southwest corner, the longest way it could possibly go to the northeast corner, um, giving lots of opportunity to build on that already permanently protected landscape. And sometimes you're able to grab some cool stone walls and that kind of thing along the way. So um, one of our principles has been whenever we can pile on to the Appalachian lands. And here um, in 2009, I think it was, Greensboro Ridge Natural Area. Um, 2013, the Mayor Niles um, Forest, which we own. Uh, the Shumway Forest and the Mill Pond Forest up on Moose Mountain, which where we hold an easement. Uh, then we helped with the Hudson Farm in 2017. Uh, then we acquired land just in that in that gap, which has now been filled in, the Britain Forest. We helped with the Mink Brook Community Forest that you all heard about in the last couple of years, and in the paper. Uh, and right now we're working here on the Adams Farm, 
and on a big piece of land um, on the west slope of Moose Mountain, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Uh, this is the one, um, the Adams Farm on Truscott Road, it's beautiful um, historic agricultural landscape, but you can see why we zeroed in on this. Um, and from this, you, you just look at this map and go, oh yeah. And what you don't see on this map is it is completely prime agricultural soils, as good as any soils anywhere in the country. And think about in Hanover, how many farms do we still have? Not that many. Uh, the other thing this doesn't show you is it has the most beautiful view of Mount Escutney as you could possibly imagine. Uh, so we're working with the landowner um, on a, an agricultural land easement there. And of course that reminds us that there are other protected lands and public lands, publicly owned lands, some of which are protected indeed, some of which have no permanent protection, like this huge block here, which is the public water supply lands. But still, there's an opportunity there to grab onto something, get something adjacent to that, to create that connectivity. So it's not just land, it's water that we want to connect. Because of course, a stream represents so many different ecosystem types. It's an ecotone where you have animals that need all of the different things that come together um, and follow those. And, and connecting it from a forested seep on the, the slope of Moose Mountain up here and a wetland at the foot of that slope with a stream that has gathered to be a, um, a year-round stream. Eventually it makes its way to, in this case, Mink Brook, right by the AT crossing. And that's where that ends up, hmm. the Connecticut River. So we all know that the Connecticut is, is one of the largest and most important migratory routes in our part of the, of the continent. All the different watersheds that um, comprise our town, and it all ends up right there. So what we've done in Hanover is to, um, the last 13 years, we've been using uh, GIS co-occurrence mapping to try to assemble um, a way to focus our thinking on what are we going to protect, where are we going to spend our money, our time, our, our donors, donations, um, to get the best bang for the buck. And uh, Craig mentioned the wildlife action plan maps that New Hampshire has. This is ours in slightly less violent colors. I can't stand <laughs> them. Um, so um, the, the pink is the really, really high quality, best quality habitat in the state. And then the uh, gray green is highest quality habitat in the biological region, tier two. And then the lighter stuff here um, is, um, is globally important uh, habitat. And then this is, we've got the layer of protected lands over that a little bit outdated needs to be added to happily. Um, and it's not only for these guys, the charismatic megafauna, it's for the birds. And it's also for folks like this, um, who need to be able to get around. They don't get around that fast. They need a connected corridor. We have wood turtles in New Hampshire and we have them in Hanover. Mm -hmm. And um, on a field trip, last spring, even encountered an affectionate couple. <laughs> and, uh, it was very exciting. Thing. Yeah, we really have the habitat. And that was, um, I'm, I'm not going to say where, but it was on a piece of land that uh, the town has recently protected. Then that, that was pretty exciting. Um, so again, we think about forest block size. And yeah, the color selections are a little bit different here than they are. But it does tell a story, especially when you have um, an animal, as Craig explained so beautifully, with such good figures, um, how much habitat these animals need. The moose, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, this picture was taken by one of our volunteers um, within a stone's throw of one of the pieces of property we're working on right now. But, you know, black throated blue warbler, um, those guys are interior forest nesting birds. They don't like a lot of edge. Uh, we think about soils a lot because not only for growing crops, but also for the quality of habitat that you can have. And the farm that we're talking about right now is, is part of that big red blob. Something to remember about our town and the agricultural soils is that we really don't have a lot of the really high quality stuff because half of it is under the wilder impoundment that the Connecticut River 
brought down, laid there, and then it got flooded. Um, the rest of it is, is in the water supply lands where they're growing beautiful drinking water for us. There were 10 found farms there at one time, but not anymore. Okay, and there's the Adams Farm uh, with this view of Mount Scudding in progress. Um, another thing we, we take into account is our place in a landscape scale partnership known as the Coab and Cardigan. And you can see we're up at the, the upper side here. Uh, they've done a good bit of mapping work. Um, in this map, the darker green is land that is either public or already conserved or both. The lighter green is conservation core focus area. And then the purple, very important, the purple is um, potential connectivity <coughs> corners. So we have all of this built into our mapping. Um, the other thing we're working with now is the Nature Conservancy's um, really great and extensive and highly confusing sometimes um, <laughs> uh, mapping to show climate change resilience. We are in the process of, of updating the layers and the weeding that we give to our maps, which I'll show you in just a second, to incorporate this latest science. Uh, here's the piece that we're working on um, on the west slope of Moose Mountain, and you can see the piece outlined there um, on the TNC map. And so you can see this is one other reason why we're really targeting that piece of property, very high uh, resilience. And because we've got people involved, we do consider cultural heritage here, the history of our landscape. This is the public water supply lands mm -hmm. before the farms were removed. Um, and we've got trail happy people in our town. So we think about trails as well. We think of them as connectivity corridors in a way, although we're very careful not to, to always evaluate our trails to say, is this, is the, before we lay them out especially, is this gonna be interrupting incredible and important wildlife habitat? And if so, somewhere else maybe, or close that trail down, which we have done a number of times. And we always need to remember where we are. <laughs> we are in the homeland of the Abnaki. They've always been here. They always will be here. It's always been their home. And now it is our home too. Um, but uh, we keep this in mind and we try to pursue things that, that would work well with that. Now the beauty of being working for a one-town land trust is that we can be really, really particular and uh, um, address our conservation planning to the different regions of our town because you know the Connecticut River Quarter is a very different place than the Ridge of Moose Mountain. And the area in between is also a completely different place. So we slice and dice our town up and have different priorities for each part of town. So we'll get all those data layers together and uh, I don't expect you to be able to read any of that, but it's things like floodplains, the conserved and public lands, elevation, climate change, this is important, public water supply watersheds, prime ag soils, high quality habitat. We do focus on the Mink Brook watershed in particular because it not only is it the largest one in town, uh, but it also goes right behind Edna Village. And if there's ever a place that is prone to flooding, uh, it's that in the Greensboro Road neighborhood. So you've all heard the analogy of, of when you're doing a co-occurrence map, or maybe you haven't, um, it's, it's like a club sandwich. Mm -hmm. You take all these different layers, you got the tomato, you got the lettuce, you got the mayo, you got the bread, you got the you know salami and the, um, if you're really thinking about it, you have a ripe avocado, the avocado goes in there and, and you put it all together. And if you slice down and you get the most amount of stuff, then that's a place that is going to rank more highly to you. But you also might think, you know, there's certain aspects of this that are truly important, like the high quality habitat stuff, just like the avocado. You give it three points. And if it's, um, you know, trails, okay, one point. It's like cutting through the lettuce, all right? So we, we use a, a numeric um, way of, of pride, and I will walk you through this very quickly in a second. But I want to tell you what our priorities are for each of the different regions of town. Um, this is always something that our lands committee talks about and revisits about every five years. In the remote part of Hanover, let's say Three Mile Road over um, to the east, climate change resilience, large forest blocks, connected habitat, 
flood protection for the headwater streams, like this little one you see here um, on the Moose Mountain property, and things in the Mink Brook watershed for the reasons of protecting Edmond Village that we just talked about. And so when we're making this map, this is an early version of it, we take, uh, say, the elevation, so the cooler the habit to higher up it is, the cooler it is, give that maybe three points, give a point for having trails in there. We put that together with the um, highest quality habitat in the region, put that together with where the already protected lands are, press the button, and bam, you've got, you know, this is, this is a crude example of what we used to do. Um, but you can see the ones that have the more stuff in the club sandwich pop up at you. And one of the ones that uh, we're working with right there is that little oblong one at the moment. And you can see why we do that. Uh, this is what the current version of this map looks like. It's a lot more nuanced, but you can see the warmer the color, the higher the priority, the more features that land would protect. And then, of course, you got to get in your car and get on, get out of your car and go look at the land. Has it, um, does it have a large home in the middle of it? Does it have, uh, you know, uh, what you think it does? Moving to the central part of town, this is a lot more complex. We love the rural landscapes and the scenic views, of course. Um, here, we are really focused on protecting our public drinking water supply in Hanover. There's no replacement for our public drinking water supply. And it is only protected by the fact that on one large chunk of it, the, the college and the town own it together and they decide together what happens to it. The third uh, reservoir is only protected by a small area of town owned land around it. So we think about that. Farmland and the prime soils. Also in Hanover, links again from the river to the remote habitats, where the areas that, that creatures are going to be able to move, and, and not just creatures, plants as well, to move from the river up to uh, the higher elevation, the nesting habitat, that kind of thing. I mean, if, if you interrupt, if there's too much interruption for the bobcats living in velvet rocks and the bobcats living on the top of Moose Mountain, we can't do a dating service for bobcats, right? <laughs> um, they need to have mixing genes to have a healthy gene pool and, and be um, able to adapt to changes that they encounter. We need them to be able to move. The flood security, again, here we're looking especially at protecting wetlands and stream corridors. Trail connections, you can't talk in Hanover without talking about trails. Um, and this is what this areas map looks like and you can see the real hot colors um, around the drinking water supply lands in particular. Uh, Northwest Hanover, river access. We have one place in our town where you can get on the river, just one, just one. We used to have two and they closed it down. Um, here's where we need to think about <laughs> from the river to the upland habitats, erosion control and flood security for the lower parts of those streams. Tributary confluences. Now, why with the Connecticut, why would we think about that? This is an area that is likely to be sensitive for Native American significance. And so when we give extra points, a lot of extra points to tributary confluence areas for protection for that reason, we don't go looking. We might ask and we might be told, we might not be told, but chances are that there's you know, something we can achieve there. And then in town Hanover, again, let's get some river access. Let's think about the links. Let's think about neighborhood recreation and trails. How are we gonna get people out of their houses away from their screens? And what could green spaces accommodate there? Not just air quality improvement and temperature moderation, but also are there little places that could be migratory habit stopover habitat for spring migrants coming up to Connecticut and hanging there before they go up into the uplands? And this is what this map looks like. Don't be discouraged by all the blue. It's not that it's not important, uh, but there are a lot of good, good meaty places in there to conserve. So put all those things together, that's sort of where we are ending up. And this is how, it's just a tool that we use to direct our work. <laughs> and that's why, right? Um, I couldn't leave the podium here without mentioning that the HOW is very kindly hosting our annual meeting here on November 14th. 
um, with Michael Simpson, who is going to be speaking about wetlands and climate change. Uh, we will put lots of uh, press out on it and hope to see you here or by Zoom. Uh, you'll miss the refreshments if you do it by Zoom. They have more control over it. Uh, but that is what I have to share with you. And now I get to hear John. So um, I'm going to I'm going to be the ecologist here, and it's going to be uh, uh, more um, about trying to look at what goes into um, the best, you know, what's the best quarter, and then um, you know, how you work back from that. And it's a challenging topic because um, what it really is is the field of conservation bi biology writ large. And we still have some key facts, uh, like the effect of recreation and noise on the uses of corridors that are still developing. Um, so we, we have this kind of, um, I'm just trying to start a timer here just so I know where I am. Well, I will just do it by old fashioned occasional looking at the um, so I'm going to start with what is a wildlife corridor. Um, this is one, un, you know, open, unfragmented land. Oops, wrong direction. Um, this is another one, a river with a riparian and farm fields on either side. Uh, this is one out west, uh, a constructed landscape uh, bridge. Um, and this is one closer to home, which I, I try to bring things into this area. I won't talk about the Hanover specifically, but I do um, want to touch on it. I include this for a couple of reasons. This is, um, so this is Connecticut River. Um, we have potential wildlife corridor across the river here. We've got a wetland and forested wetland here, a little bit of farm field in between. Um, but at least no development. Um, there's some other interesting things going on that I want you to think of, that you would to think about as a quarters. These long, skinny things, they can work as wildlife quarters. Not well, but they get used. Um, and what's interesting about this particular location is the three things that fragment the mm -hmm. east west mm -hmm. connection are the interstate mm -hmm. road and the railroad. And you could put a bridge over those right there and do some restoration work and you would quickly have a way to go this way and a way to go this way through this landscape that is highly fragmented by a, a farm. But, and you'd also get some animals using the little tree lines. So it's just to think about what, what a corridor is. It looks like a mess, but um, there are places in the landscape that will come together and, and turn into it. And my final one that nobody thinks of, and this isn't the perfect picture, but I'm, is a log across the stream. There are times where a simple log across the stream is a wildlife corridor. Small mammals getting from one side to a stream is, in certain places, going to be really critical for uh, wildlife movement. And we have a, a long tradition in this country of cleaning our streams and harvesting right up to them. And we don't have a whole lot of wood in our streams. So that is a wildlife corridor, too. I'm going to start first um, in the background of, of, of kind of landscape ecology and trying to do it very quickly. So um, I, I hope this all works kind of quickly. This is landscapes degrade in a predictable pattern, and it repeats itself over and over and over again. And it's driven by economics. So it is a highly predictive um, a set of sequences. I'm just taking my home territory to give an example on a very local scale. But in uh, original settlement, the first thing they did 
was to seek out the best soils. Uh, you know, here you've got ribbons of, of agricultural land. Um, they put roads in the easiest places, interstate going up the Connecticut River Valley. And um, that was the first place that settlement occurred. Oh, the other high value, they were all after high value agricultural or high value resources. One is transportation or rivers, um, the best soils for agriculture. And the other really important thing were dam sites on rivers for power. So um, that was the first step. Um, it really is not landscape fragmentation, it's, it's habitat um, loss. The be very best, from a wildlife perspective, habitats disappeared. The riparian corridors, the richest soils, and your connectivity in streams. Um, it, was it was more, I think of it more as the loss of some of the best in the terrestrial. In the aquatic, it actually is fragmentation and the actual start of really big about fragmentation because these dams were literally built as walls and they were not friendly to fish. Uh, Connecticut River, we're still trying to get salmon back hundreds of years later and I, I don't think we ever will. So the next stage would be, you know, small scale agriculture, uh, paved roads, towns, cities, widespread clusters of development. This is where you start, your landscape starts getting dissected by um, settled areas and roads. Um, you still have large segments of forest. That's was the, for most of New England, that would have been the, the um, habitat, the natural habitat. And so those are still functioning as high quality uh, forests. And as you saw on some of the maps, they'll, they'll still exist in lots of places. Um, but you're also getting places that are getting more fragmented by roads. And some of those habitats are no longer what would be called source populations. So you have source and sink uh, type of habitat. Source means that your, your natural functions are happening at a scale and um, healthiness, for lack of another word, so that you get uh, offspring producing excess. Right? Excess offspring is produced to go out into the landscape. Sinks are where you have habitat that attracts animals, um, but they can't reproduce enough to actually put uh, offspring into the landscape. So those are, that's an important thing. And as you start uh, dividing up the landscape, you start getting into what is really the perforated landscape, which I would call semi-rural. Um, there, the functional forest, as opposed to shade trees around the house, are starting to get pinch points. And so you're gonna get sort of what the maps you've been seeing is high value blocks, and less valuable blocks. And it's harder to get forests to line up on opposite sides of the roads. And edge habitats start um, becoming the dominant um, habitat. And that brings in everything that comes with at the edge. Excess deer, invasives, large po um, populations of um, small predators that hurt bird species in particular. Those are the skunks, the blue jays, the cats, the foxes, the dogs. They're present everywhere in your landscape at that point. And your core habitats are shrinking and disappearing. And finally, you get to the fragmented landscape, which is uh, large scale ag or suburban. And here the forests are now taking up less of the landscape than the fragmenting features. And you've got um, very hard to find contiguous forests on opposite sides of roads. And there are very, very few core habitats. And the trees are now just providing cover for corridors to, for things to move around. This is just a quick, you know, one end of the, that continuum. And it says my battery is running low, but it's plugged in. Um, so that's the, um, and now I'm, I'm going to try to shift it a little bit there. Well, hope it's greatly. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to take the same concept, but bring it into habitat versus corridor, because I'm making a distinction here a little different than the other two uh, speakers. In habitat, I'm talking as a place of source, uh, source population. <coughs> the, the systems and nature is functioning well, and corridors are creating a different function for the landscape but there aren't places that necessarily you're getting reproduction. And so in the rural landscape, which is um, what we're all you know, pretty familiar with, it, 
you have interior forest blocks. As Craig talked about, the state now calls all the biggest ones interior forest blocks. And there you have suitable habitat. And therefore, your goal is really maintaining undeveloped swaths of landscape in good big blocks. That's straightforward. And the source populations are free to move about. Roads tend to be narrow. Things cross them, no problems. Semi-rural, which is really much of the upper valley, is would be considered uh, semi-rural. Here, connectivity blocks become much more important. You have more farms, uh, more houses, more pets, more invasives, more busy roads. But you still have usually multiple possible corridor paths through that lands branching through that landscape. Um, you've got things that match up undeveloped parcels across roads, but still edge species are starting to predominate. And then the final part of it is, is your fragmented and um, suburban town centers. And here, um, well, let's step back on the semi-rural one, uh, semi ones. These connectivity blocks are used to take your habitat, your interior, to connect them, interconnect them. So very much um, what we're talking about in <coughs> setting out, Adair setting out the, the um, priorities, that is using those connections to create this interconnecting piece. Once you get to the uh, completely fragmented suburban, there the corridors are literally do, usually doing nothing but provide cover for travel. Um, I don't have enough time to go into this in any detail, so you're going to have to visually absorb the information. I'm using salamanders as an example of, you can pick your species, they, they stay the same, but salamanders produce a very unique problem. Their maximum movement is 3,000 feet, um, that's their maximum home range, and if you had all the vernal pools protected, which is their core habitat, 90% um, of the landscape is used. That's really a lot. If you cut out the smaller ones, suddenly your landscape use drops to 60, the distances increase. People have traditionally said, well, you have a 100 foot buffer around each vernal pool, you've got a you know, really good protected area. Um, but really, 95% of the activity is more like 600 feet out, you know, and a long ways from the 3,000. And why is this all important? is because the, bio, um, the biomass of the amphibians, the salamanders, salamanders, not amphibians, salamanders, is greater than the biomass of all the birds in the forest. They are a really crucial part of the food chain. And if you don't provide linkages and habitats for them, you're going to lose the food chain for an awful lot of your wildlife. So um, it's a, a simple example, really hard to solve. So my next place is quarters versus recreation. And this is, um, New Hampshire is at the forefront of this. Um, this is a, a graph that they show the impact of uh, trails on wildlife as a function of distance from a riparian um, area. And as you can see, it's large. Um, they actually found effects all the way out to 625 feet um, right. and pretty heavy at 300 feet out. Um, so, what is true is overwhelmingly, um, and this is a generally true statement, is the corridors, wildlife corridors and trails are usually co-located, and that's because they have similar conservation problems. They're very costly to assemble, they take lots of time, and you can get failure really quickly by loss of a single parcel. And so, they are thought about in the same ways, and so that often gets them co-located. And if you're thinking about wildlife corridors, you're in a landscape where you're also having to think about trails for the recreation for the people that live there, because you've got enough population that they're gonna to need to recreate. So those things are, are, are both happening at the same time. The science is evolving right now, but it is also overwhelmingly clear that trails are detrimental to wildlife. Even walking results in a decrease in, in, in places and changes of bird and small mammal density along a trail. And, it's be, and people walking with dogs are even worse. And that's because of a, what's called a startle factor. You just are using energy, they're on alert, they're not feeding, they're doing different things. Biking is probably even worse yet because it has the same startle factors, but it's, you're covering a lot more ground. So you're bumping into a lot more wildlife. 
on the flip side of it is, well, it doesn't look like a human, and that actually makes a pretty big difference to wildlife. They're really keyed in on humans and dogs as, as their um, enemies. Um, and it's interesting, it, the data shows that motorized recreation actually has less impact. Um, we don't know all the reasons why yet, but it is really critical when you're starting to think about, oh, automatically thinking, oh, hiking trails are compatible uses. And the key is really, there are two keys. One is it's very different for different species. Some of them habituate, some don't. And it's how heavy the use is is really key too, because if you are um, going out once, you know, I live in a neighborhood, I, I hike outside in the neighborhood trails a lot. It's one person per, you know, two weeks versus somebody, many people in a day has a very different so now we move to the goals. What are the goals of wildlife quarters? What species will benefit? And here the um, spatial scale becomes really, really important. And you have to do something that's very hard, which is to think about many scales simultaneously. Um, you know, the, the stack maps is one way of doing it. Um, I also like to say you just have to be able to start thinking in many scales. And my simple example here is you have to pick the scale to at carefully so you ask the right question. So you can be scared of a 30 acre clear cut because in the first order watershed, that would have an immense impact. impact. Most first order watersheds are very tiny. And that same 30 acres in an undisturbed lowland forest of 500 acres, it would be nothing. And so you can't, you have to be careful what scale you're looking at. The other example that is really easy is wetlands loss. We have all kinds of laws to protect our wetlands. We think, oh, we do a really good job. Oh, this little project only took a little bit here, a little bit there. Actually, the history of wetland loss is the history of 50, losing 50% 50 of the country's wetlands, um, higher in some areas, uh, but basically by nibbles. It's, nobody set out to destroy 50% of our wetlands. They nibbled that. And so you've got to think about the scales really carefully. Um, yeah. So the, the context matters. I've mentioned that you getting small mammals across the stream is one kind of scale issue. That's very different than how does a herbaceous plant move north to for climate change. Those are two very different things, both using basically wildlife corridors. And so you, you're You've got to be able to think at those scales. Originally, we were talking, and, and actually both of the, the first two speakers really fit into, um, well, actually, uh, the, the first one talked about the fact that mammals move around the landscape. And that is really the fish and what mammal movement around the landscape was really where wildlife corridor concept started to develop. But, and I think, uh, um, Adair uh, talked about this, is that TMC, the Nature Conservancy, put out this resilient ma land mapping, and that has changed the entire thought process. It's there now go across the country, and it's in the context of climate change, and it is making it much more complex. It's no longer, oh, how do we get large mammals to move around the landscape? How do we get rid of our dams or our fish flow? And it's just as important. We're going to have if we're going to keep functioning nature in the landscape, we're going to have to figure out how to make it move. Sometimes it's simple and direct, a road crossing. You get the amphibians off the road next to the vernal pool, or you reduce road collisions with a large mammal. Simple. Sometimes it's about aquatic sy systems. Make stream buffers and make sure your culverts are in the water at both ends um, so that you have natural stream move and big enough so you have natural stream movements and you have temperature the right temperatures. Fairly simple. Sometimes it's about, and hopefully increasingly more, about landscape permeability and resilience. And that's about climate change driven to support all species at a very large scale, really hard. It's really hard. And in the upper valley, we're going to be, have a real problem because we are a place where climate refugees are going to come and move because we're going to have basically a perfect climate, enough water, got really productive soils. And so we're going to be really time constrained how to put it <coughs> in these very complex paths. 
Usually it's about, as I mentioned, connecting large areas of habitat in a local context and sometimes a regional context. So you've got your big blocks and you're trying to connect them. That's usually what it's about. And it's usually someplace between simple road crossings and client resilience for all species. And basically it's green belts. And um, you just need to be honest what you're when you say you're protecting a wildlife corridor, <coughs> you've got to be honest to people because you're, it's costing a lot of money for what purposes. And it's you put more money into certain ones that maybe have bigger impact in the longer term. And maybe you are okay with a few species because you also get other benefits and you can mix it together. So that's the, the next piece is really the heart of what, are, what makes up a high quality um, wildlife corridor in the upper valley. First, and I'm just going to, these are as fast as I can march through 10 things. All existing tree repair and buffers on every stream must be maintained. Streams, including the first order, create a web across the landscape, and that helps maintain terrestrial species connectedness. Um, there is nothing better than, than that to create those webs. Um, everything that happens in that landscape or in that watershed um, in, from a water quality per benefit or threat is felt all the way through that system. So it's really important to keep what you've got that's in good condition. The second one would be repairing buffers less than 300 feet on each side should be um, basically um, rewilded where possible to create 300 feet on each side. And there's no significant section of a stream should have less than 100 foot tree buffer. And you'll see why as I step through these. But um, the importance is because in lower order streams, this zone between the upland and the flowing water is just stupendously important for the stream health and biodiversity of both ecosystems. It's a really, really important sensitive part of um, systems. And 300 feet captures what most of the zone that is used by wildlife on average, with 100 feet, first 100 feet being the most critical. And the other reason 100 feet becomes really important to restore is that removes most of the sedimentation that goes into a stream. And right now, whether you're on the White River or you're on the New Hampshire side, a rainy, stormy, a couple days later, you can see that we're still shedding a lot of soil out of our watersheds. No harvest, this is where we um, get into these, some of these widths. That is no harvest, natural tree fall in the first 50 feet. Um, better would be 100 feet. Most of the country uses two tree lengths high as the ideal buffer um, from a, a coarse woody debris into the streams. Um, and around here, 100 feet would be not fair to that totally, but you capture longer than the typical bowl. Um, these, this is really um, so important because the entire stream ecology, the flood regime, the nutrient retention, the carbon storage of, are all dependent upon pools <coughs> created by uh, woody debris dams in the streams. Everything in the stream is dependent upon that. And as Science has progressed, we, find out, we keep finding out more and more how important those pools are. So a stream full of woods and whole pools behind them is an ecologically healthy stream. Take those out to make your canoe path and stuff, you don't have a healthy stream. So the other reason is to, to keep these unharvested streams, um, uh, repairing buffers, you know, basically a 600 foot strip, 300 feet on either side, um, or at least a 200 foot strip, is you've got a, a mature and old growth forest then throughout your landscape, through that web, and that will vastly increase the resiliency of the, your landscape. If you've got all the structure of the different types of trees within your landscape in a connected fashion, that's going to be way more resilient, and the movement of species through that landscape is much simplified. Um, the other pot reason you need a mature forest along these is that a 600-foot wide strip helps 
mature forest species, which tend not to be highly mobile. As a general rule, the things that use early succession, they know how to find those patches. It's really simple for them. In mature forests, the things that live there, particularly um, some of the smaller stuff, they can't move very far. And so these strips of <coughs> good habitat instead of just corridor for them will be beneficial. And as I said, 50 foot unharvested will at least capture your big bulbs over time. And that's what's really important in streams. Fourth, uh, pretty self-evident, all the culverts and bridges should be a uh, size to accommodate the increased stormwater runoff we expect from climate change. There should be no hanging culverts in your corridors anywhere. You're defeating the whole purpose of the riparian stream. Streams are part of your connected landscape and they just have to be connected. There's no substitute for that. Um, and all the larger ones, box culverts, really should have natural bottoms on them so you have a natural stream bed. Really important. So next one in the terrestrial corridors, the ones not based on stream um, repairing buffers, should be a, a minimum of 300 feet of well-developed forest. I would argue ideally 600 feet, 300 is the the limits of where you lose all of your edge habitat or your edge effects. Um, and so 600 gives you the two sides of that. Um, and I, you also should have mature trees scattered throughout that. So you've got the different types of structure used. So if this is just a terrestrial border, you're not going to end up with a lot of other things going on. But by having a mix of trees, you'll get uh, the maximum use by wildlife. Try to incorporate and connect your highly ranked natural communities and the um, rare species sites. Um, Adair talked about that. It's just, it's efficient conservation. It's let your corridor connect your most important pieces of your landscape from a biodiversity perspective. Sporadic sudden noise is detrimental. So um, you can use undeveloped protected fields as a buffering to that. Um, so that you, it doesn't have to be a perfect forest to buffer if you've got a, a conservation of a farm, you know, next to it, that field makes sure that you've got your noises from houses and things is um, much further away. Uh, a forest around a house, particularly a house with a dog or a cat, doesn't count as quarter, sorry. Uh, that is just shade trees. Um, if, and that's about it. There's, you know, there are things use it but it is not core. Uh, another whole topic could be the effect of our pets on, on wildlife. Um, for those parts of the landscape where it's really important from a climate, climate, climate connectivity, think about rewilding the best places so that you end up with the best corridors. Um, so for this upper valley area, in the Fairley, Orford, someplace in that area is gonna be where you connect across the river where you can get forest reasonably close. And same thing in the kind of a Scutney playing field or maybe down into probably Scutney playing field, maybe you'd have to go a little further south. But where the forests approach the river is where you're gonna to have to sort out, sort of like I did on that one slide. How are you gonna create a really robust corridor? And so think about rewilding, and I use that word intentionally because it can't just be let it grow and it'll all be full of invasives and the deer will eat it down. If it's going to function as a high value corridor, you're going to have to think about it from a whole rewilding perspective. That's a whole other field of evolving knowledge about how you bring back functioning of landscapes and deal with invasives and, and things like that. And so then we get to the big bugaboo is that um, it's the big problem is no trails within a primary forest and wildlife corridor. And as I led in the, the kind of background, you know, the studies show that they don't drop off. Those the effects of those trails don't drop off until about 400 feet out. And um, so you're talking about area that is encompassing what all of what I'm calling is a high value corridor going through your fragmented landscape. The corollary of that, of course, is don't put your corridor next to your highest density um, residential developments. 
because you're going to have people wanting to use trails and you're going to have dogs that want to be out there so um, those are not the best places to set up your corridors route you know route your streams away from uh, trails away from streams and wetlands and vernal pools and other sensitive areas that's kind of straightforward what isn't straightforward is do the work to figure out when you have a property that you're protecting where are the wildlife using it most or at least and then route your trails where they're using at least. That is a lot of hard work to figure that out. But with modern technology, not impossible and well worth the effort if you're gonna spend the money to create these corridors, which are not cheap in a place like here, Upper Valley, um, it's, you really spend the time. Um, have trails if they're necessary um, to cross the corridor, not travel within the corridor. So you can't, you, couldn't design something perfectly to keep the trails out of all corridors, but have them go across it so the impact is minimal instead of going along it. Um, and this is all exceeding, exceedingly hard. The, the disconnecting trails and corridors is just, it goes against human nature, it goes against how we sell um, these ideas to the public uh, and nature, you know, people won't protect nature without uh, or protect wildlife if they don't experience it. So you're faced with, we need trails, we need corridors, and we need uh, wildlife appreciation. And those three are not all compatible. And I think the, the lesson here is we just have to give up on the idea that everything is multi-use and start thinking about, no, we have to sort this out if it's gonna work for a long time into layered uses spread apart and they become part together occasionally. It's also exceedingly hard because our current zoning, and current, rightly so, from a town planning perspective, encourages open space. If you've got a large commercial development or a high density residential development, almost always the regulations are designed to cluster that into one part and leave the open space in another part. And that all works fine for the developer as long as that's an amenity to those things trails for their workers or the people who live there. As soon as you say, no, that's gonna be your no touch wildlife, you're just gonna get resistance. And so it's really politically incredibly hard. And I mentioned politics. It's just public access on public land and for ordinary people, um, not just people that can afford estates, always wins over just being wild. So I'm not going to hide from the fact that this is the hardest thing you're going to have to do is, is in, to, to separate those. My sign is saying somebody is in a room. Am I supposed to admit that? Um, anyway. So the, my last one, number 10, is the high quality wildlife corridor. I mean the high quality wildlife crossings over busy roads or under busy roads, they work. And this is, you know, there's a long period where people debated whether they worked or not. Um, 87, this is a chart showing the percent of vehicle, wildlife vehicle collision reductions by, based by kind of typical things that people have thought about, you know, whistles modeled on your car, all the way down to, you know, the fences, and basically overpasses and underpasses, you get an 87% reduction. In the West, that more than pays for uh, the cost of that overpass. So it's catching on in the West. Um, in the East, it's a, it's a little more complicated um, and they are not cheap, um, but they work. Uh, you need 330 feet, ideally on a landscape bridge, the picture I showed with you know, plants and stuff on it. If you're just doing um, large mammals, it can be much less. The highway standard for landscape is a minimum of 230. That's the national highway standard for a landscape bridge. Um, for us, the, some of the early bridges for large mammals um, are tiny, and they still use it. Culverts come in many sizes. Interestingly, deeply buried is be better than anything because you get rid of sound. Sound in, from roads is one of the factors that um, and that big depth protects it. And interestingly, the structure of the soil actually makes it so it's cheaper to build um, so that you get some benefits there. Um, 
the most immediate need that, that we were are going to face some of these um, the most immediate need if we're going to maintain that Boston lot, Dartmouth College land in, in Lebanon, that is a big enough piece to be considered pretty good habitat. Got a lot of trails in it, but um, if we want to maintain wildlife there, we're going to be looking at something over 120. There's just no to connect it to Rick Sledges and then ultimately to Moose Mountain. The other ones are going to be in the north and south, trying to get the corridors across the river, but you've got to get across the interstates in both places um, and the railroads. Um, so you, we're, we will be facing those at some point. Lastly, to leave it on a high note, is something is always better than nothing. So I don't <laughs> want to leave this with, oh, you just got to work on you know the perfect 300 foot wide old growth forest is the only thing that's going to work. Something is always better. And if anything I've learned over the decades is that uh, game cameras and GPS collars have shown us that animals continually surprise us what they will tolerate. So I think it was in the first presentation we that you know, two, 20 years ago, fisher were considered an interior forest species. You know, no question. There are fisher now on Cape Cod. And they're, they made it through New England's you know, most fragmented landscapes, and they're on Cape Cod. So they can move around the landscape. Might not be their ideal habitat, but they're surviving and expanding. And uh, my favorite example um, is, and I'm going to do this even though I, I have a horrible slide. Um, <laughs> I, at one point, and uh, Jim Kennedy, Confirm my memory, created a slide that was much higher resolution because I do not know where I found it and I could not find it in my files. But this is a map of radar collared um, signals from Bobcat. And as you would, huh. would expect, here this is a pond, this is in Shelburne, Vermont. This is a pond, and the lake is out here. There's farm, farm area, the batteries are dying, they're officially dead. There's a farm area. Um, and what I wanted to point out is, you know, they're using the treed area that you can sort of fuzzily see. But more interestingly are the little strips of uh, trees between the fields, and the bobcats are also using that. So um, I have never seen a bobcat behind my house, but I know somebody has a game camera. They're back there all the time, so they move around. And I'll leave you with, that, with uh, something that's better than nothing, a strip of isolated forest 100 foot wide will do wonders and do it compared to 300 feet but you're running a major trail down the middle of it just live with it. they're not all going to be perfect they never will be perfect but at least strive for your best forests thank you q a i've lost track of time i tried to talk fast but there's still not much time <laughs> Who has questions? Sure. Start. I'm curious about going back to this idea of trails being compatible with corridors. And you even talked about, well, if I go hike on a trail once every two weeks, that's very different from, and you didn't say from what. Oh, like how much activity is significant we, we, activity? We don't know. That's the, no. uh, so it's very different from in a fragmented landscape where people are using it daily and multiple times a day, you know, walking their dogs, multiple, you know, 20 people, 20 families using a trail out their back door um, is really different than once a week. Somebody in my neighborhood in a very rural, there's, you know, doesn't even use some of the trails, you know. We don't know how much no. we're, we're starting to get that. We at least have the data that says it has an effect. And so now that we need to figure out more carefully, or at least I haven't bumped into the data yet. It may be coming, I haven't searched the literature in the last couple of years, but it may be developing where we are now able to quantify it. But um, so we looked at tonight about piggybacking on the Appalachian Trail areas. I know you just said we don't really know, but is, is Appalachian Trail, do we I, know that's significant people in terms of uh, wildlife activity in corridors, or is the, that? So the part of, I, somebody asked a question or something, the, the corridor for the Appalachian Trail started out really narrow, the un, you know, undisturbed part of the buffer to the trail, and now they are looking, you know, 
significant, you know, basically what you can see from areas. We're talking thousands of feet in some cases. So I'm not worried much about the Appalachian Trail. Yes, there will be a, a little path that won't have a whole lot of wildlife, but a lot of it is high elevation anyway, anyway, anyways. And so isn't the highest, the most desired place for wildlife. They get pushed there because our landscape fills in the low places, but that's not where they want to be or to move around. It's just where they get pushed. In this case, there will be, there is a band on both sides of the Appalachian Trail big enough that that to me is serving as a wildlife corridor. And there's regulations against cross trails across the you know, Appalachian Trail so that there, there are very few crossings to the trail. So it's it's actually not a bad situation, even though that there's a trail going down the middle. As I said, every one of these things is so site specific, it's hard to have general rules, but that is a perfect example of, well, they created something so mammothly wide, it probably isn't as bad as what I would tell you, because I'm thinking of a much more fragmented landscape. Now, the part going through downtown Hanover, that's not serving anything. Um, it's cover at best for animals at night. And a lot of movement happens at night. I, I actually wanted to, I tried to, I couldn't figure out technologically how to get a video from the New York Times, but there's an article written in 20, June, sometime in 21, it's online that has various videos of highway crossings and so much of it is at night and some of it is just it's fascinating the, the one that jumps out is just hilarious is there's a bad oh, a coyote waiting for a badger to go into this culvert together they do they look like for everything as friends going through this culvert <laughs> um, anyway that's a little tangent any other questions yeah oh, sure go ahead yeah oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, how can towns um, protect and create wildlife corridors? I know Adair is doing a lot with the Hanover Conservancy in Hanover, but it's a responsibility of town master plans, conservation commissions. I mean, how would, how is this all going to happen? So, my short answer to that is that this is that where they're most they're most expensive to do and most critical are in our most developed landscapes. And those tend to be your suburban areas around here would be Hanover, Lebanon. Um, I, I think that there, it's part of it is just going to be if, if it's important, and I believe that most people would find it important. There just has to be money set aside every year that flows into conservation commissions to do that. Um, it's not going to be done through regulation. It's not going to be done. Um, appropriate in the town money. It's an expensive undertaking. So a town like, you know, conservation group is, is ideal in that they're thinking constantly about that. They have the relationships to raise money and um, can do the, the detailed work. It gets harder as you get into bigger landscapes where you don't have each town by town. But I do think that the only answer is that money is going to have to be dedicated to it. It's part of of mitigation against climate change, really. I should really love that you asked your question first. I, I find the management milieu here in the East fascinating. Recent, uh, very privileged uh, climate refugee from Western Colorado. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just think it's, it's really, really interesting that, that all the private land ownership, as well as the uh, conservation commissions and et cetera, is there. Um, a organization currently providing education for landowners on using um, GIS or maybe providing access through like ArcGIS to landowners for them to understand, for us to understand how we fit into that matrix of, of connectivity. Um, I just think like um, how powerful a tool that is to, to see how you fit into the, the bigger picture without uh, a state or or a uh, federal agency like telling you, hey, you yeah. have your land. No, yeah. and, and most of this isn't going to be federal agency. It's all local yeah. or in state. I mean, in Vermont, the state, um, the GIS is extremely accessible by anybody with lots of explanation. It's not for the light of heart, you know, but the data is there. You can really dive deep. Um, the Nature Conservancy Resilient Mapping, again, is freely open to everybody. It is confusing. It is 
That one is harder to use. <laughs> um, local groups are doing it. Culverts is a very active um, working directly with landowners about wildlife connectivity. That's probably one of the more active ones, I would say. I would add, though, for Hanover, Hanover finally got great GIS. Just great. You go on the town's website and you can find it. Um, it happened in, I'm going to say, like about 2013, 14. Jim, where is Jim still here? Yeah, and um, you can you can figure it out yourself how to click the layers on and off, how to go to ortho, how to zoom in, how to zoom out. You can get everybody's tax information on there. You don't yeah, want yeah. there, uh, but you can you can really find out a lot mm -hmm. that way and have a ball. I mean, I'm a mapaholic. I confess. And, and I, I'm glad you reminded yeah. people because I I always think oh. It, Massachusetts towns are the only ones that have that, but mm -hmm. Hanover definitely. This really the state in Vermont is doing more and less. Greg, you know of towns that have taken that on, but usually um, it's the towns with a lot, lot more um, process and stuff that have, um, on the positive side, um, active commissions and stuff that have invested in that. I'm used to it more finding it in the Massachusetts towns um, around Boston because they're faced with needing GIS all the time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So just that as an example to answer your question um, of how some of these things can occur, um, I, I'd like to bring up the example of the Mink Brook Community Forest, which is the area on Greensboro Road, um, of which a number of people in this room were involved in conserving um, when the early phases of when we were involved in that property, we did focus groups, we did survey online surveys, we got a lot of feedback from both professionals and the public. And one thing that came out in the in the surveys and the focus groups was, you know, what do you want from this property? It's going to be property belong to Hanover Town Forest. Um, people said, oh, we we want trails. We want connectivity for people. Mm. We want to be able to get from the AT to here. You've got the Hudson Farm Trails, Highway 38, and others, which makes sense from a people trails perspective. But after we did a, a wildlife assessment and ecological assessment of the property, um, we find that it's such a special place for animals. Um, and the habitat for that, that to put trails in there would, would scatter um, that as one, you know, open space. I don't know, I can't remember how many acres uh, it is on both sides. 92 on the south side, it's 150 something. On yeah, the side. 200, 250 yeah. acres, um, yeah. you know, on both sides of Greensboro Road. And so the perspective changed and it's that Right now, there's very few trails in there. I mean, there's some that are down by the brook and that circle the meadow that are easy access. But you go in the upland area, and we have not really developed extensive trails through that property. And you know, at the current time, we're, we're not because it's such a special place. And so the perspective changed. You know, the public wanted trails to connect to the AT and to Hudson Farm, and after looking at it from a wildlife perspective, it's it wasn't the best thing. So we've changed our perspective and have backed away from that. When the Hanover Conservancy acquires a piece of land, <clears throat> we evaluate it for suitability for trails. And, um, and we always observe the property through a full year to watch where the water goes. We put up game cameras. Uh, we try to, we track, we, you know, send people out all year long to, to look at the wildlife activity. Um, and then we, if we decide, well, all right, we might, and we do use the fish and game um, planning tool for that as well, um, then we'll, we'll work on it for a while. But with the Britain Forest, for example, on the north, part of the north part of, of the western slope of Moose Mountain, um, the landowner said when he can donated the land, he said, I just want a trail out there so the public can enjoy the property. And we mm -hmm. went, 
Okay. Okay. Because we already had one trail on a nearby property that was built by International Papers. <clears throat> And so we thought, all right, we've got to honor the donor's uh, wishes. We went out and we scouted this. Um, it's a, about 79, almost about uh, 80 acres up there. And we got over into the northern part of it, and I suddenly realized I had to be very careful where I was stepping. And I realized I was in the middle of a bare latrine. <laughs> and so we all agreed, oh, we are not going to have a trail here. <laughs> and so we figured out a place on the very opposite side of the property um, that we could have a nice little loop that showed a lot less wildlife sign, and we called it the Black Bear Loop. <laughs> uh, but that accomplished, you know, what the landowner wanted. It kept it within a, you know, it wasn't a going through kind of trail. It was a, a loop around, come back. Um, and it avoided the um, excitement of the parallel train. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. And the, the state of New Hampshire um, had, a, I don't know, it's probably not a property a lot of people know, but the, with their research work was done in the Lower Shaker um, wildlife management area that they own. And um, they, when they finished this trail work, they realized that they had too many trails. I mean, their, their mission is wildlife and they had too many trails in there, so they closed. Um, a decent number of them. Um, Is that the Shaker area in field? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's it, the, the whole issue. I, I'm. I don't want to leave anybody feeling. I'm. I, I think trails are really important. The corridors are really important, and I know that they're interrelated. People will not protect conservation land generally if they don't have an appreciation of it. So, I, I think all of these solutions are really. The solution. It's just really micro scale. All right, working with an individual land or figuring out a little loop to get a sense of it. And occasionally you make a compromise to accomplish some bigger trail goal. Of, but it's if, if you think about all those three things at the same time, I think that um, you'll find solutions. The problem I see is that people love walking along riparian areas. Just I'm just as guilty as everybody else. It's the most sensitive area in our landscape, basically. Um, everything uses it. Bears, everybody uses it. And yes, it's also so enjoyable listening to a stream and seeing the pools and all of that. And so I think we'll find creative ways to go visit the waterfall, but then go off and not follow the riparian stream. And, you know, there, there's just ways to allow us to have that appreciation and also respect that we aren't going to change the animals um, or at least we've pushed them out of much of their best habitat and so we got to leave them some to create their ability to move around any other questions that sure we have time we have one more question i'm curious about um because both you talked about it and Dara talked about it as well and that was this idea of agricultural soils or farm soils productive soils you talked about it in the context of, of climate migration um i think it's you were talking about it when you're talking about the adams farm and preserving that and i'm, I'm sort of curious in, in 2023 with the populations that we have what are we really thinking about farm soil in Hanover? What's what's what is what is the value of farm soil there? To me, it's uh, because we we have lost our grip on our agricultural heritage and our agricultural economy. Um, I I cringe at at getting lettuce in the grocery store that is has traveled across the country, has been irrigated unnaturally by the Colorado River that just should be in the Colorado River instead of in my lettuce. And uh, strawberries that are, you know, from God knows where. Um, I think anytime you've got, a, there's a, as much an educational and cultural value to that as there is to, um, to actually having fresh locally grown food where you don't have to use gas to, to get it somewhere. It's in small pockets, for sure. It is, but but those 
those have been nibbled away badly. The, the biggest swath of that big red chunk of prime agricultural soil is residentially developed. Yeah. And there's a Montessori school there. There's a bunch of houses there um, in the middle of the woods. And so those soils are not, they're not going to be growing food again. But I just don't want to give up on the last one because I'm an optimist and I'm a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my, my slightly larger scale answer to that would be that, um, to put it in perspective, the Connecticut River Valley soils are the equivalent of the Central Valley in California. Yeah, they, yeah. they are some of the best soils in the country. And luckily, up and down the whole Connecticut, not just in the Upper Valley, uh, a pretty high percentage of the best flat fields have been conserved, so they won't be develop their easements on them because land trusts have been active in that arena, particularly in New Hampshire and, and Vermont. Um, but I feel like because we're going to be under such development pressure, that you even the small little pieces of ag soil are going to be really important because you can grow a lot of vegetables on a five acre farm. And the other piece of that is to realize that our picture of farms is going to change too. Right now, we think of farms as cornfields and cows and things like that. I hope that they still are vibrant here once we stop subsidizing the Colorado River to grow them where we shouldn't be growing them. But also, an awful lot of food is going to be grown under. Um, I would call it a greenhouse, but they're no longer greenhouses. They're high type of arrangements. They're, you know, they're going to be structures, um, and so those will fit on small parcels too. And the more we do preserve the the high quality soil, the highest quality soil, and the more likely we will keep the connection to the soil, which in my mind is really important. But we will we'll make other decisions in that too. Thank well, thank you very much to our three speakers, and thank you all for coming.